Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal on this April 30th, 2015 day on our calendar. I'm your host, Greg Anthony, and you're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You can catch my show every evening from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. That's on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Now, yesterday we spent the day talking about the origins of evil. Where does this come from? Why does God allow it? And uh, we discussed the mark of Cain, and that brought us uh, to Tupper Saucy's last chapter in his book, and he t- titles it The Two Ministries. And I thought we'd go over this again, just because people always ask me, how do I live in this world? Uh, when I realize all that's going on, especially when you understand the origins of evil. And he gives his ex- um, his ideas, and I thought, uh, although you may not agree, uh, like I said, these aren't my uh, ideas, these are his, and uh, there's some that I agree with and some I don't. But I thought we'd look at what he thinks about surviving in this world, which he calls the New World Order. And remember what we said yesterday? Let me just go over it again real quickly. And that is that, uh, just real quick, we'll go right back. We live in the New World Order, just as people under Augustus Caesar did. This is nothing new, folks. Uh, Not a future thing. It shouldn't be feared or avoided. The New World Order is a present reality to be identified, understood, and dealt with in a way most pleasing to God, because by all accounts and standards, God created the New World Order. And we looked at the biblical history of that yesterday in yesterday's show. So if you want to catch up on that, go back to my show uh, yesterday. It's in the archives here at First Amendment, or it'll be on my website later on today at Arctic Beacon. Uh, com, because the Bible really records great decisive events in the progress of human life uh, up to the close of the first century A.D., creation of earth and the fullness thereof, creation of man, woman, their turning away from God, the first conception, the birth, the first sacrifice, the first murder, the first insignia, the first city, the first flood, the surviving family and its peculiar relationship through time with God. Now, let's, uh, before we get into Tupper Saucy's views on how to live in this world, a story came across my desk and, um, It's about this, uh, you know, it's titled Psychologically Conditioned to Accept Martial Law in America. Now, this is a good example. How are you going to live with this? Uh, But in the article, uh, it states that, uh, have you noticed that we are starting to be bombarded with images of troops in the streets? Have you noticed that the term martial law is coming up a lot in movies, news broadcasts, and even in television commercials? In recent years, it seems like the solution to almost every major crisis involves bringing in the troops. In fact, it has already gotten to the point when something really bad happens, a lot of Americans in media cry out for troops to be brought in. And we see that uh, patterns over and over again, don't we? Just remember what happened in Ferguson. Uh, protesters whipped up a frenzy and the riots began. The police were ordered to stand down and not intervene. And finally, the National Guard troops came to rescue and save the day. And... Uh, This is the exact same thing going on in Baltimore. And uh, the National Guard troops uh, all over the nation have been training for this exact type scenario. A couple decades ago, many Americans would have regarded the notion of martial law in America as absolutely unthinkable. But these days, the threat of civil unrest is causing an increasing number of Americans to embrace the idea of troops uh, and allow them to patrol our streets. The anger towards the police that we see in the city of Baltimore is very real, but there's also seems to be a lot of signs that the events of the past several days have been orchestrated and manipulated. And uh, we find that all the time. Another false flag. And we look, uh, but what, what do we see there? Uh, then it's uh, school kids appear to have been herded by the police in one neighborhood in Baltimore. Uh, when they were let out of school Monday. Uh, when school was let out that afternoon, police were in the area equipped with full riot gear. According to witnesses, the neighborhood in Baltimore, the police were stopping buses and forcing riders, including many students who were trying to get home, to disembark. 
We also had an unprecedented thing in baseball. They were, they had a baseball game yesterday in Baltimore, but they wouldn't let the fans in because they f- feared for their safety. Now, give me a break. Feared for their safety. So what did you see? An empty ballpark, everybody crying out, it's because of the unrest in the streets. And then you looked <laughs> on the top of the hotels. People were watching from the hotel rooms. Then there was a whole big gang of people watching outside the ballpark, through the gated fences. I mean, what's the difference? Were they unsafe there? They didn't seem to have any problem watching the game from outside. Uh, So we see, again, there's this possibility that there was a false flag event just in Boston again. And people are sending me pictures showing how the the orchestrated actors were whipping up a frenzy, and etc., etc. So how do we live in this world? Well, let's look at what it's all about, according to Tupper Saucy. And he puts a quote in the beginning of that chapter by Woody Allen. And that was in a movie, it was, I think it was from Radio Days. Uh, the years passed so quickly, and where did they go? So quickly, and then we get old, and we never knew any of it. <laughs> we never knew what any of it was all about. Well, I'm going to tell you what it's all about today through the eyes of Tupper Saucy. By the way, I'm writing a screenplay on this man because his story is so good. It was about his, he went on the lam for 10 years. And then they finally caught him, and then he researched his book. And uh, during the time he was on the lam, he realized who the Jesuits really were. Because one of the, prosec- the prosecutor in his case was a Jesuit priest. <laughs> Interesting. And then I'm doing one on Tony Alamo and the minister. He's spending 175 years in jail, and that's an incredible story that we document on this show. Uh, go back to some of my archives, and you'll see a lot of programs. I'll be doing another one later this week. So let's get to what Tupper Saucy says, uh, so we don't end up uh, never knowing what it was all about. Well, he thinks to me, he says, makes the Bible such an inviting resource to figure this out, is in, with the vigor that the rulers of evil have suppressed its unlicensed reading. It's been uh, his experience that as predictably as such rulers play with the truth... The Bible, he says, forthrightly tells it. So there we go. Uh, The previous, uh, he says in his previous chapters, uh, they were written with the presumption that the ruling institutions are what they say they are. Under the Cain Covenant, they must truthfully identify their origins, which they do with Kabbalah. Hey, that's why I bring up all these shows and tell you about the signs and symbols of these people. They tell you who they are. But people just don't see. Now, he says this. He says, it's only fair that I write the final chapter here with the presumption that the Bible really is what it says it is. It claims to be the unique revealed word of God and the veritable literary embodiment of Christ. If we disbelieve that claim, we must disbelieve all the mottos, insignia, bulls, encyclicals, laws, acts, ordinations, constitutions, oaths, and decrees of these rulers of evil. According to God, as given in the scripture, the purpose of the law is to regulate evildoers. And we read that that quip, uh, that uh, verse from Paul the apostle, who said, uh, we also know that law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, and for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for adulterers, for perverts, for slave traders, and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. In other words... Any behavior not conforming to this gospel of God belongs to the law, which obviously, from its subject matter, is a jurisdiction foreign to Christ. That is why the Vatican hides behind it. And that is why your government hides behind this signal, this uh, idea that we're a free and Christian country. Because if you come against them, which they want you to do, because the more aggressors they have... The more chaos they can cause and regulate, and then basically say they protect you. 
Yeah. That's how it works. Kind of interesting, isn't it? And uh, guess what? The more aggressors, the more they can instigate war, the more they can... That's why they instigate all these wars. They have to have an enemy. Because once they have an enemy, then they're protected by the covenant of Cain. You see, the Bible can make a lot of sense. Even if you... You know, many people don't even go to because they've you know, been told that uh, they can't understand it. It's really not what it says it is. But read it just for the historical value. And you'll see a lot of interesting things. Now, in this scripture, it teaches what? What is it? What is the gospel command? It says, uh, repent for your sinful lifestyles. Love your neighbor as oneself. Loving and blessing one's enemies. Oh, these are hard ones, aren't they? Giving freely without thought of reward. Forgiving debts and injuries. Preaching that whoever believes the evidence of Christ's life, death, and resurrection enters the royal family of God for all eternity. Imagine a world like that. They wouldn't, the rulers of you wouldn't have anything to do. Would they? No. Not every personality, however, we know this, is drawn to this gospel, are they? Although scripture tells us that everyone is asked in some way throughout his life to know what it is. But many can't follow it. For the protection of those drawn to the gospel, and for the management of those foreign to it, there exists the rule of law. Rule of law is the system by which authorities, bearing Cain's powers and insignia of kingship, rule the world. This has not just been going on for the last 30 years. This has been going on since the beginning of time. And... Very briefly, why don't we compare the gospel to the rule of law first? What does the glorious gospel of Christ say? Now, what would you rather do? Repent of sinful lifestyle? Or when you want to, what does the rule of law say? It says manage a sinful lifestyle. Manage it. The gospel says love thy neighbor as oneself. What does the rule of law actually teach you? To achieve advantage over your neighbor. Yes, that's what it teaches. That's what we live under. The idea that we got to... Come on, Max. You want to come in? Huh? Yeah, the doggies want to listen. Come on, guys. It's a hot day today. Come on, Moose. Get the other one in. Yeah, they love listening to this show, you know? Okay. I think go out and tell their dog friends all about it later on. All right, Max and Moose... Okay, let's get back to it. Not every person has drawn to this, but what's the rule of law tell you? It says achieve advantage over your neighbor. It doesn't say love your neighbor as yourself. What about love and bless one's enemies? Rule of law basically conquer one's enemies by legal means. What does the gospel say? Give freely without thought of reward. And, of course, the rule of law says give requiring reward. The gospel says forgive debts and injuries. And the rule of law is completely opposite. Enforce payment of debts and injuries with interest. Yes. Who came up with that? First banking system. Look back at the Knights Templars. And the good old Vatican boys were all involved in that as well. Now, the Gospel says, Preach that whoever believes the evidence of Christ's life, death, and resurrection enters the royal family of God for all eternity. But what does the rule of law say? Preach the absentee, impersonal God of Cain, deism, and other faiths. The following table in his book here, this is a good one, shows how readily the Roman Catholic Church state organism conforms to the rule of law and not the rule of God. So how can they call themselves Christians, folks? They do. And how do your leaders call themselves Christians when they're not? Now listen to the difference. Now the rule of law says manage a sinful lifestyle. Remember that? What does the secular government do? Legislation, police, criminal justice, philanthropy, media. What does Roman Catholicism do? Pontification, Inquisition, the Holy Sacraments, media. Now, what about the rule of law? Competition. Achieve advantage over your neighbor. One-up your neighbor all the time. What does the secular government say? 
self-interested political action, competition, partisan, partisanism, nationalism. What does Roman Catholicism teach? Self-interested political action in the guise of ecumenism, e.g. the Council of Trent. It's never been changed. What about conquer one's enemies by legal means? That's the rule of law. What does the secular government do? They create war, emergency powers, Darwinian survivalism, patriotism, etc. And what does Catholicism teach? Ends justify the means, the rationale of the church militant. The regime, now that's the Catholic way. Now gives requiring reward is the rule of law. Give, but you want something back. What does secular government says? Profit-based trade and commerce. What does the church say? The Catholic Church. Salvation earned by good works. The selling of indulgences. Yes. They seem to be cl more closely connected to the secular government, the rule of law, than they are to God's gospel. They're completely in tune with the rule of law. So how do these people get away with saying they're Christian? I, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine, but it works, it seems. Now, preach the absentee impersonal God of Cain, deism, and other faiths says the rule of law. What does the government do? Preaching in God we trust, while prohibiting Bibles in schools. Hmm. Now, if we're a Christian country, why... Can't we have a Bible in a school? I I can't figure that one out. And what does the uh, what does Roman Catholicism in the Vatican say? Pray they pray to saints for intercession with an absentee impersonal savior. Oh, you know they also have the doctrine of infallibility that we've discussed, etc., etc. It goes on and on, worshiping of idols, statues, etc. <sighs> What Saucy says here is interesting. He says, the rule of law is what Scripture calls a ministration of condemnation. That's what the Scripture says. The strength of the rule of law is what? It's sin. This is observable in how law, in how law is, is at its most vibrant when ferreting out, prosecuting, and punishing crime. Officials of the rule of law are called ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. You know, and uh, doesn't that mean good works, good end, bad works, bad end, right? As might be expected of a ministry appointed to Cain, that's really what your leaders in the Vatican and your leaders in your governments today are, just followers of Cain, whose scripture tells us was the of the wicked one. The ministration of condemnation, the rule of law, belongs to who in the Bible? Who would they say? To evil, to Satan, right? A.E. When you start digging deep into these Freemasonry tactics and all of these skull and bones and all of these secret societies that your leaders are a part of, and the Vatican, you find the Satan worshipping. So it's not really crazy when you say that. People look at you and they roll their eyes. Oh, they can't be doing that. Well, they are. <laughs> It is a shocking thing to realize that according to scripture, world law, this is what the scripture says, I don't, this is Satan's province. That's why the Vatican tells you that it hides behind Jesus, but is actually worshipping Satan. And all of the signs and symbols that they wear and they have at the Vatican prove that. But surprisingly, scripture also teaches that a certain degree of cordiality exists between God and Satan. Now, the use of that words are interesting, right? But that's really what I get out of some things when I read in the Bible. We learn from the book of Job that Satan is welcoming God's heavenly throne room. Hmm. Even though he has led a rebellion in heaven for which one-third of the angelic population were cast out. His business consists of going to and fro in the earth, uh, walking up and down in it since he is an angel and therefore incapable of bodily existence. He can only affect human affairs by one, providing spiritual direction to human beings who consent to him as the god of this world, 
and two, manipulating forces of nature, as really the prince of power of the air. To secure popular consent to his spiritual direction, he employs his supernatural abilities to make himself irresistibly attractive. He's an angel of light, they call him, the author of the humanist extravaganza. Pomp and circumstance, breathtaking visual experience, disorientating emotionalism, architecture that overwhelms. Isn't that exactly what the Vatican reminds you of? Jesus Christ agreed. Now, you know, he means to convince us that he wields the power of God, uh, Almighty on this earth, too, that uh, we are therefore bound to follow his moral guidance. And Jesus Christ agreed with the first proposition, and in so doing, affirmed, in my opinion, that's Saucy's opinion, the covenant between God and Cain, but admonished Satan that only the written word of God is fit to guide mankind and the trickster alike. Quite apart from its infallible moral guidance, the written word of God appears to be the only truthful disclosure of Satan's origin, scope, and purpose. Its potential for damaging his appeal is why the highest rulers of law have traditionally prohibited reading this book, or at least not diligently encouraged Bible reading, and I can tell you that for a fact, growing up as a Catholic. (laughs) Interesting, huh? The earliest Christians, though, folks, they well understood Rome's indispensable satanic role in human affairs. They understood it. How come we don't? Because we have fallen prey to lies. And no one lies better than that guy that's going to visit America shortly in September, the Pope. In the legal process which Christ established for members of his church, the harshest sentence an offender could receive was abandonment to Caesarian authority. So, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over, but if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or tax collector. You know, going back to all this stuff, we're trying to figure out, again, in the last minute here before I take a break, how to function when you understand where, you know, it's easy to dismiss. Uh, I, I love the people that I, that disagree with me on this subject. Uh, now, I'm not saying Tupper Saucy is right here, and there are certain things that I disagree with, but, you know, this idea that where does evil come from? Well, everybody has their own choice, and that's where it comes from. I don't think it's that simple. And, of course, we do have a choice to play ball with the Vatican or play ball with God. Uh... Isn't it good to understand, though, how it's laid out in the Bible so you can understand something about this? It's not just a simple choice. You want to know where this evil came from. Why do all these people believe the wrong things? That's really what we're all about here today. We'll be back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Have you read The Last Prophecy? The book of Revelation, who can understand it? We believe that God wrote his word to us for our understanding and salvation, on which so many diverse Christians believe in the same fundamental principles. But not so the prophecy of Daniel and Revelation. Has God by his Holy Spirit given a sure interpretation to these mysterious passages through the centuries? Yes, he has. The only difference to the individual is on which side of each prophecy he stands in time, before or after, past or future. The last prophecy is as much a book of history, fulfilling prophecy, exposed in such a way 
as to leave you without a doubt. Because we are living near the end of this era, we should be able to understand the substantial amount of the revelation which has already come to pass. Get the book, The Last Prophecy, which is an abridgment of E. B. Eliot's Jorge Apocalyptica, the most comprehensive work ever done on the revelation, condensed down to a mere 258 pages. You will come away with numerous incontrovertible revelations into the book of Revelation to easily dispel all of the futurist confusion which has become so popular over the last century. Visit the shopping page at FirstAmendmentRadio.com to get your copy. Get 20% off when you buy it at the FirstAmendmentRadio.com shop. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Okay, we're back for the second half hour of the Investigative Journal on this April 30th, 2015, a day on our calendar. And uh, we're going over the origins of evil and uh, where they came from. And there's a good possibility that this Mark of Cain story that's told in the Bible gives us the uh, the origins. Now, some people may disagree and say something like, well, everybody, the reason that the word evil comes from is that you have a choice. And I say, how can you have a choice if you don't understand how this all operates? Because what choice do you have if you're getting lies from the time you're born? Do you have a choice? No. I believe once you look and understand the origins of evil, and then of course you do have a choice, but then you can make a choice on what side you want to be on. Because you have the facts. You have some truth. And that's all we're trying to discuss here. So bear with me as we continue. Because uh, when we were talking, we were just talking about what Paul was saying. And uh, he did say something. When you are and assembled in the name of the Lord Christ, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of one Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. In both cases, Paul was heeding Christ's commandment concerning brethren who rejected both the glorious gospel and the rule of law. Turn them over to the Caesarean criminal justice system for their own good and for the good of the church. Thus, the earliest Christians were keenly aware that Rome's purpose as the spiritual heir of Cain and the incarnation of the satanic spirit, spirit was what? To teach the people of God not to blaspheme, to destroy the sinful nature thereby, and save man's spirit from eternal damnation on Judgment Day. The violent, good, working spirit is characterized at Psalm 2.9, and again in Revelation 2.27, as a rod of iron with which Christ rules nations and dashes them to pieces. The Judean political leaders, anticipating a Messiah who would overthrow Caesar, didn't understand that Rome was Christ's rod of iron. Because he would not dash Rome to pieces. They declared him an impostor, demanded his crucifixion, and gloated when he failed to come off the cross. They couldn't not fathom his consenting to suffer under the violent justice of his own rod. Nor could they forgive, foresee, 
that he would use the same rod on September 8th uh, in the year 70 in the person of the Roman general uh, Titus, who captured their rebellions, rebellious city Jerusalem and dashed it to pieces. Paul, when his non-believing Israelite brethren continually mugged, persecuted, jailed, tortured, and hounded throughout his Mediterranean Aegean ministry, understood the rod of iron. It was in his letter to the Romans that we find perhaps the most eloquent statement on the New World Order ever written. So when people are really looking to understand this New World Order, isn't it interesting that if you listen to other alternative stations, when they try to tell you it's the Jews, it's the Bilderbergers, but it can't be the Vatican, they overlook all of this stuff. Because they're not giving you the truth. They're not even giving you the opportunity to make up your own mind. I can put this information right alongside any information you have on the New World Order, then make up your mind. But maybe in, the, in Romans, we find perhaps the most eloquent statement regarding the New World Order ever written. And why don't we read it? It says this, it says, Everyone must submit himself to governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist, powers that be, in the King James Version, have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear or the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good, too. Think about it in these terms for a change. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay the taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Now, since the epoch uh, of Emperor Constantine, the Roman papacy has fostered a concept that the ruler who terrorizes wrongdoers is necessarily a Christian. Pope Sylvester, the bishop of Rome, who supposedly converted Constantine to Christianity, saw nothing strange in, in a warrior coming to faith in a crucified Christ by slaughtering his enemies. This think thinking pervaded Sylvester's successors, as well as the Crusades and the Holy Roman Empire, the European nationalism, the American Revolution, and the war of Southern secession, and the wars of the 20th century. Indeed, perhaps the black papacy's most admirable psychological conquest is that Protestants generally agree that armed rulership is an authority instituted by God for Christians to exercise. Since there is no scriptural authority for a member of the body of Christ to bear any kind of armament whatsoever other than the figurative weaponry of God's word, agreeing to such a principle signifies prima facie adherence to the moral guidance of him who bears the power of Almighty God on earth, the person who legitimately bears the mark of Cain in a long succession begun by Peter. Yes, the popes can truthfully declare that Peter is their foundation by holding in mental reservation that the Hebrew pronounced Peter means firstling, which of course is Cain's primary attribute at firstborn of Eve. Supporters of the argument favoring lethal force Christian rulership usually stand on a single scriptural passage. It's the verse in Luke 22 wherein, as the betrayal nears, Christ admonishes his disciples, saying, If you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy, and buy one. I've often heard Christians, militiamen, some of whom I'm not ashamed to call my friends, says Saucy, use this to justify arming themselves against the minions of unjust rulers. 
But Jesus explained otherwise in the very next verse. It is written, And he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. In order to fulfill the prophecy of Christ, had to Christ had to be numbered among lawbreakers, and bearing words would certainly make of the disciples of any true prince of peace. As soon as the disciples produced two swords, the minimum number constituting the plural transgressors, prophecy is fulfilled. Christ then told them, it is enough. From then on, no more cloaks uh, were sold, no more swords bought. Roman Christianity's success at avenging evil has resulted in a world that severely mistrusts the Christian gospel. It is to Rome's advantage that the Christian gospel be mistrusted. For any soul that mistrusts Christ is Rome's lawful prey. It's to Rome's advantage that governing bodies be rebelled against as tyrannical, for rebellion against tyrants is disobedience to the glorious gospel. Much as uh, Saucy despaired over the vicious taking of innocent life in the Waco massacre, uh, I had no choice to see a rather standard church militant inquisitorial procedure against perceived rebelliousness. And from the Inquisition standpoint, uh, when you look at this whole story, it's, it's quite interesting. Yet, Sassi says, one can live intelligently, freely, and safely in a world legitimately governed by the trickster. How does that work? You know, he says this, but let's see how it works. The secret is revealed in the research which the trickster has labored so tirelessly to marginalize. The secret's in the Bible, he says. I cite again that remarkable verse in Habakkuk, H-A-B-A-K-K-U-K, uh, two. Uh, verse 4, in which God tells us that although governing bodies have the wrong desires, we can live safely in their faith that God will not punish them for annihilating their moral enemies. Scripture reduces all human interaction to really two great ministries. He says it re- it's the ministry of condemnation and the ministry of reconciliation. Condemnation is the rulership of evil by law. It judges and does justice. Since its subject is the criminal mind, the strength of the law is sin. Condemnation requires the brilliance of the firstling king, along with the deviousness of Jesuitry and Sun Tzu. Condemnation enforces its authority with deadly force, uh, does not bear the sword for nothing. However, the ministry of reconciliation teaches and administers the great gospel of Christ. Reconciliation does not judge uh, or do justice. Rather, it judges spiritually. It loves, nurtures, suffers, patiently forgives, and rejoices in the truth. Reconciliation never fails because its strength is not sin, but the power of God. The ministry of condemnation operates out of the presence of out of the presence of the Lord. Its only proof of divine association is an inert substance, a seal, a mitre, a collar, a badge, the mark of Cain, the insignia of its authority to terrorize evildoers. The minister of reconciliation is directly animated by the Lord operating within. It it proves divine association by everything it does. Its mere existence is its seal. There are exceptions, of course, condemners who reconcile, reconcilers who condemn. Many loving Roman Catholic priests. Now, you see, this is the point I I get at a lot of times, because people say, oh, you're a Catholic basher, but it's not true. I've never been that. There are many, many good people uh, that call themselves Roman Catholics. Now, many loving Roman Catholic priests uh, dedicate their lives to a form of reconciliation. And I'm not talking about the the pedophiles and the pro, you know, and that scourge that's uh, involved in Roman Catholicism. But uh, let's look at uh, these these people. Many loving Roman Catholic people dedicated their lives to a form of reconciliation, confession, and absolution, 
But aren't these sacraments really a process of condemnation? in which the confessant pleads guilty and is sentenced on the spot by a priestly judge to certain uh, penitential acts which pardon his guilt. Reconciliation, according to the scripture, forgives the sin free of charge and directs the confessant's energies not to punishments but toward a repentant, constructive life within the mind of Christ. Now, Saucy says there are lots of Catholic priests who do true reconciliation, even though it's technically heretical. Uh, for example, my el- he says, my elderly a British Jesuit friend stationed at the Ye Zoo was a reconciler of sorts. He took confession every week, day, afternoon by the clock in Italian, a language he didn't understand. My father, says Sauss, was saucy, was a good lawyer who denied himself many a handsome legal fee by trying to reconcile marriages out of divorce court. He was a minister of condemnation by trade, yet the word of God written on his heart made a reconciler out of him almost in spite of himself. This, says Saucy, is is what scripture calls every knee bowing at the name of Christ in heaven on earth and under the earth. It's proof of the great power of reconciliation that the world... uh, highly esteems condemners who reconcile, condemners for whom the name of Christ may not be important or even credible. Saucy's private opinion is that many many who find Christ uninteresting have been sold an inferior gospel by hypocritical preaching. Uh, He says he tends to agree with uh, G.K. Chesterton's remark, It's not that Christianity hasn't been tried and found wanting, but that it's hardly been tried at all. And despite crossovers, says Saucy, of condemnation and reconciliation, work together as opposites, like male and female, sea and land, night and day, yin and yang. Condemnation punishes us for alienating God. Reconciliation lovingly brings us together with God. Condemnation cannot bring us to God, but it can drive us to Him. Reconciliation cannot punish us for alienating God, but it can release us to condemnation, which walks to and fro in search of corrupt reconcilers to persecute along with the the usual suspects. Release is a conciliatory operation. The spiritual judgments of reconciliation are executed in release, while the natural judgments of condemnation are executed by the opposite of release. Restriction, restriction of body, comfort, freedom, property, options, life. Restriction is the flexure of condemnation's muscle. And this is good for reconciliation. It provides God a captive audience. Uh, I saw it, says Saucy, in dozens of jail cells in Tennessee, Oklahoma, Georgia, Mississippi, and California. Condemnation can so restrict that its subject cries out for reconciliation. In jail, God is not a philosophical proposition to be deliberated at leisure. He's a vivid benefit grasped as though he were a key to the jailhouse lock. I've seen it so often under so many circumstances that I have to regard it as a principle. The more restriction, the closer to God. So even though the ministry of condemnation is directed by Satan to do justice among evildoers, and what could be more just than for Satan's to rule evil... The ultimate beneficiary is he who ordained the whole system in the first place. For just as Paul says, Satan is an angel of light and his ministers of, are ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Scripture is a catalog of satanic mis- ministers who were absolutely necessary for Christ to perform his finished work. The serpent, Cain and Enoch, Ham, Nimrod, Esau, Pharaoh, the Amicalites, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Cyrus... Haman, Judas, and many others. Some are deplorably wicked, others surprisingly moral. It was Judas' sense of guilt that drove him to suicide. The Jesuit priest who inaugurated my prosecution, says Tupper Saucy, on the feast day of St. Ignatius, was a satanic minister, and he was absolutely necessary for my maturity as a Christian. He sent me on a 15-year journey that has brought me to this page. And once Saucy says he understood this minist- these two ministries, 
hard questions answer themselves pretty easily. What can a responsible citizen do to restore moral, fair, and constitutional government? First, he says, realize that no judgment that government is immoral, unfair, or unconstitutional can be executed unless by an authorized person. Only condemnation has authority to alter government's patterns of conduct. To change governmental by conventional means, I must become one of them, a condemner. Can anyone name a true reconciler who is great in the world? To gain influence among condemners, I must master the art of Sun Tzu and the art of of Satan and the trickster. Little good this will do for, as my investigation has tended to show, always the preponderance of condemnation's resources go into keeping the system evil. It gets worse. Isn't that an explanation for why? It always seems to get worse. And what about the congressmen who, from your little hometown in Iowa, that seem to be the most just and loyal person and nice person you ever met in the world, and he had all these great ideas of how he was going to help mankind and your city and the country. And then pretty soon, the next thing you know, he's on the take in Washington. Because he joined their club. That's simple. And once you get involved with them, you become just like them. And he says, if uh, so, he says, if I build forces capable of meaningfully altering the system, the masters will terminate me because they are authorized by God to avenge sevenfold those who would slay Cain. And even more is that we see that their power even increases through this hereditary connection to Cain. In short, the potential for improvement within the system of condemnation appears to be limited to cyclical periods. You know, we have pretty good times and then bad times. And isn't this obvious from the history and the news? Of course, God could change governments by simple miracle. And and revelation, uh, revelation say he will on the last day. The fearful day of cosmic shakedown and the unrepentant evildoers were burned with the beast, and only the perfect will remain. Scripture is silent as to when that day will come. In the meantime, reconcilers are told that improving human rulership is their responsibility. Not by taking control of the system, and not by sealing themselves off in a well-fortified commune. Reconcilers improve the system by simply doing one thing. Making yourself available to others. Reconcilers are attractive to even the condemners. When you think of it this way, because you're not a threat to them, are you? It kind of uh, takes their train off the track, so to speak, because you see, they want to instigate you to revolt so that they can claim that you are an enemy of God and country. And according to the Mark of Cain, they're authorized to do that. Now, reconcilers, true reconcilers, who just make themselves available, spreading this word so that people can make a choice, they're attractive, really, to the condemners because they don't judge or attempt to do justice. They don't put down or attach blame or pin guilt. Consequently, reconcilers are not perceived as a threat. They are wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Oh, this is not to say that reconciler this is not to say that reconcilers condone evil. No, it's not. Their posture towards sin is this. People should know right from wrong. People don't need to be told they're sinful. People know. God's written laws on their hearts continually reminds them. What the world needs is the friendship of someone who is God minded if not well-versed in the Word of God. Someone confident in the love of God who can patiently and not judgmentally hold the most evil of souls in friendship while helping it work through repentance to healthier values at its own pace, at a person's pace. And, in a sense, you know, for much, many, you know, 
all of a sudden, even without knowing the stuff, I started being that way. I remember I was, in the beginning, I was very adversarial towards these people, towards the Vatican and everything, and I began to change my tune without even knowing it. And the reason I did was I didn't want to condemn, even though I disagreed with evil and what they're doing. It is enough to let people know of the deceit they're under, and people will, at their own pace, figure this out. And that's why I always said, you know, I'd like to sit with the Pope, talk to him. I'd like to sit with the President and speak with him about these things in a non-judgmental manner in a way to see exactly what they're all about inside. And that be uh, enough for me. So you can live with this. Many years in condemnation have driven me, said Saucy, into the ministry of reconciliation. Isn't that the way it goes? And the heart of reconciliation is basically love. And he says, I now appreciate the simple words of Felix Mendelssohn when he questioned, why should any man offend the people in power? Offending people in power, offending anyone, is no longer attractive to Topper Saucy. Back uh, tomorrow on the Investigative Journal.